to close. It's now recording. <laughs> All right, let's continue the same way as, as yesterday. Again, we have to use this graphic with Red Canada. We are the podcast lecture, but uh, I hope we will manage. Okay. Is the voice? Yeah, I'm recording, but I'm not sure if the voice is clear or not. Okay, can anyone confirm the voice in the virtual audience? Anyone? You can write something in chat or say. I, I, I have also written in chat. Sure. <laughs> I no guess one no one is listening. Hmm. Yeah, we can continue if no, but it should be good because we, we are recording it. So if you don't have any it is clear, but bit low quality. Okay, someone says okay. Yeah. All right, good. So let's continue with the uplink. Uh single user, multi-user, uplink with multiple antennas. Oh, sorry, it's a single antenna, multi-user. Uh, uplink with multiple antennas at the base station. Um, I'm now sharing. Are uh, you are sharing? Yes, ah, yes. Okay. But can you notice? Can you just do something with So you can share and video it, but you can do both. Yeah, you can close the Zoom, so you can use your own slides. Ah, that's a good one. Good idea. Good. All right. Uh, okay. Uplink multiple users, multiple receive antennas. We looked at the uh, the rate region, which is the same as in the uh, size of case. Uh, no difference. Just replacing uh, scalars with vectors, variances with covariances. Everything else is exactly the same, right? We computed the sum rate, we computed the, the, the single user rates, assuming the other user is decoded first, and the, uh, the, the last user to be decoded, the first three, for which the match with uh, is the optimal receiver. Then we looked at the, uh, uh, the rate region, which is again pentagon, like in the size of case. But obviously, if you have just a single antenna, the pentagon would be much smaller. <clears throat> then we derive uh, a single user rate for the first decoded user directly from the uh, mutual information formula. Then you can also use the, uh, the sum rate expression and subtract the the rate, and what we get the, after some straightforward. Time to license, you will get the, uh, the rate for the uh, uh, first decoded user. This is obviously the same as computing visual information between Y and uh, X1 for this particular case. So X2 or user 2 has been as interference. It's not there. It is basically the SINR expression for the user one. At the output of the All right. And similarly, in the size of case, all these points in between A and B, you can attach it by time sharing, right? So in, a, in point A, you decode uh, user to one first, user to uh, 
second. Now, if you want to get the point C, which is in, in between, let's say, uh, in between or in the need points between A and B, you could just time multiplex. Uh, every other frame would be decoded with decoding order one, two, and uh, every other frame with two, one. Yeah. And you get that. Okay, the general K user case. So in general, if you have K users um, accessing the base station with multiple antennas, okay, we have three users, one, two, three, a one, a two, and a three. Right, so the basic signal would be one plus H2, two plus H3 plus noise. Okay. So for this case, for example, K equals three. So the brain region is not anymore dependent on the only We have seven points in this particular. One for each possible non empty subset S of use. So basically, a set of users is obviously one, two, three, and the subsets of one, two, three are obviously the one, two, three itself. One, two, three, and then one, two, one, three, two, three. And then one, two, seven subsets. Right? So for each subset, we can then write the uh, array constraint. So we start with the, from the first one, so we have R1, R2, R3, which is the sum rate. Again, this is exactly the same as in the size of this one, just going from scalar to the effect. So this is obviously maximizing the user information for the input uh, S1, S2, S3, and Y. And that would be then it's what it in Y three. Okay, A Y minus A Y. That X1, X2, X3. You get you get a lot that I plus sum over all three users and uh, corresponding um rank one matrix is HK, HK. Okay, and we have these other uh constraints. So let's assume let's assume that user three is removed. So what is the sum that left for R1 and uh, one and two? So R1 plus R2 only by uh, usual information between one two and Y given X three. Right? And this would be uh block that I plus information over one two. So going through all these complex seven points. <laughs> so, in fact, uh, in wireless communication two, you had uh, homework to draw three user rate region for size of case. You have uh, seven red constraints constraining so all the points inside that uh, uh, equal uh, are feasible points outside. Okay. And then 
where in the summary equation we have six polar points. Right? So all the points in this plane here are summary optimal, right? And can be achieved again by time division multiplexing between uh, uh, on the decoding orders. decoding orders. One, two, three. One, three, two. This is six. 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 Right. <laughs> six corner points. So you have you have all these corner points at six with six decoding. Six different decoding orders, and all the points in between you can get by time sharing between this six decoding orders. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And the sum capacity, obviously, that's one of the constraints um, by one of these uh, quarter points. By this sum. Again, they say the famous people computed from this uh, usual information. Okay, just like in the uh, point to point micro case. We can look at the uh, uh, MMC uh, thick uh, receiver optimality. That's why we're talking about this, this sound rate formula that we uh, derived earlier. Okay. All right. Okay, so you can start expanding. Uh, for example, from for any any general K, you can assume a uh, decoding order one, two, three, four, five, K. Okay. You can also assume a so we separate the first user uh, from this summation, right? and then we call the remaining part as matrix R1. Okay, so we have a we have a uh, formula that looks like what is it? Part one plus E one H zero H one H one. Right. So obviously we can split this into R one square root R one square root and uh, wow. No. Right. If that goes up, this also should go up. I think you can see that. No, the camera doesn't show. Doesn't doesn't show the board. No. Okay, all duration, the rate shift is the same. Initially, you wrote it. Yeah. 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 Here it will be fine. Interesting. Yeah, if you can uh, write there, it will. No, it's because of the light. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, if you remove the curtain and write on the this port, it will work. But anyway, so this, this is quite quite straightforward uh, multi, uh, manipulation. So you just introduce I there. You know, multiplying this high matrix by R1 square root from the left and R1 
the R1 variable from the right gives you the R1 matrix, and then the product is in the matrix and its inverse identity by itself. And now uh, you can use the log bit. I was saying we a rule. You can declare this part here uh, A and this B, so you can move then the other side and comes R1 again, and then you can uh it's not that I'm going to have to We have the product of the determinant and then log from the logs. And I have set the remedy R1 into this, this part here, and then this one here uh, includes only the uh, user bond uh, component, right? And again, another day for my class PR, which is also RC, column, column vector times row vector, same as one plus row vector times column vector. So here, this is the column, this is the column. Click them, and you get. Yes, I am of the one. Okay. And then you can just proceed. Proceed with everything. I start over from here for the name. And then again, over all users. Where at each stage, you apply the MMSC receiver for the remaining users. Right. That must be yes, removed. Okay, that's very straightforward. This gentleman from the multi Okay, then in the uh, uh, point to point memo, we also uh, look at this option that I will begin. First scenario where we have a uh, Plus um, a massive minor base station, and then just relatively few users. Okay, so the ratio between N R and K is large, right? N R is much larger than K. Okay, then as in topic here, if you have two users and two. Okay. So asymptotically, if if these channels are drawn from ILD, which is of course non practical, but it also applies to line of sight case, right? Yes, when when the uh, in the line of sight case, you might recall from the file from the two, and that the ray size becomes large, the corresponding facial signature becomes um, very narrow in that angle the length. Right? So when the size of the array increases, the, the channel that um, the spatial signature corresponding to this higher can become like a pencil, so called pencil beam. Right? So if they just I reconstruct the receiver based on the angle of arrival. I apply a kind of DFD like well, the spatial signature, just construct that the receiver beam based on the angle. So it would be a pencil beam pointing this user, and the, the, the side flow will be extremely small. Right? And then we can also form another beam towards this user, and similarly, the side flows are. So the side lobes are vanishing when NR goes to infinity, right? And it becomes just uh, like a uh, 
like a pencil being no side loads, no independence. The same as in the IA, right? meaning that H I H one is whatever case times H two is all the normal I okay? Okay, uh, there was a minor mistake in that original slide, so I had to speak to the mind. So now here, we should make this more general that the channel actually um, contains also um, a large scale component, which is what we call A, AK, and it's A in general on this one. Large scale trading component. Path loss or path gain and a normalized component. H bar, where H bar follows ready Okay. Now, this, uh, when the ratio between NR and K becomes large, the product. Uh, H a can times H normalized by NR becomes basically AK. In this way, right? If you have two users, you have two by two matrix. The cross products are zero. You know, H1 terms in H2, zero, H2 terms in H1, also zero. And then H1 terms in H1 becomes Q2 uh, Q2 uh, the IID normalized by N R. This is the same as H1, normal H1. It's goes to one, then Size of each vector goes to infinity. Right, that's right. Right, that's right. Yes. A1. Yes. A1. Because the variance, variance of each term, each entry of A is AK. A1, A2. This part of the right. case. Now this matrix A is a diagonal, so we can call this A for this body. All right. So now we just uh, work in the, in the formula. So the KX obviously gets to be the uh, multi-user minor, no, no cooperation between users, so KX is equivalent to one and two an independent screen from each counter. How how again? So we plug that in here is again the log and then I plus uh, I plus A B equals I plus B A and all of course the size of the from N or from Okay, then we plug in an agent service. This is something here and compensate the complex of this N or here we add N or in the numerator and we get this. Okay. So you might recall actually this is this looks exactly the same. For one user, it's exactly the same as in the line of sight minor in uh, in wireless communication tool when we looked at the channel modeling, we looked at the, the line of sight minor capacity. It's exactly that, right? For one user. And now we have and this applies to the IID and line of sight case similar. It's exactly the same this case. You do this um, in the IID case, all the entries of 
phase are independent and the cross product of these independent vectors becomes zero asymptotically when the size of the vector goes to infinity. Similarly, the line of sight case, the, the facial signature becomes just a mm, pencil beam. The, the side of Spanish is so no interference with the uh, spatial signatures that are assigned to be the receiver. All right. <laughs> so the match filter has an optimal solution, but it applies to very large distribution that on the render this ratio is very large. In general, you, use, you should always use MMC. But if, if the, this difference is tenfold, the match filter should use uh, MMC mm -hmm. yeah, in any case. Just to remove the remaining industry interference. Okay, another interesting uh, scenario, just to remind, remind you the, what happens in the SINR uh, when we plug in that MMSD uh, formula into the, the general, uh, sorry, MMSD receiver into the general SINR expression after, after some steps can be express and the scale of one right it's quite neat so now assume that um uh, now assume that the nr increases But okay, let's consider first the case where the case fits but in on increase. What happens to R? R K. It's not so easy to say directly you should use matrix inversion lemma to, to find out the, to switch them by the time. Anyway, so you, you basically the same thing will happen as in the, the match is the case that the MMSC thing that becomes almost equivalent to the match. Well, asymptotically it becomes a equivalent to match. When NR goes to infinity, K is with other substance. Maybe that's another goal for it. Not very straightforward. Okay, but the more interesting scenario is when uh, NR and K increase with the same ratio, right? We have this basically the, the size of the that HK, the length of the, the vector HK is increasing. RK, the size of the RK, which is NR times NR, is increasing. Also, the rank of the uh, of this part here is increasing with the same ratio as with NR. So both NR and K increase with the same ratio. So it turns out that in, in such scenario, the SINR becomes deterministic. Okay. So you don't have to actually do this. You don't have to do the inverse, the matrix inverse, which is quite, which is of course, which grows cubically. The complexity of the, the matrix inverse grows cubically because of that. The matrix. So 
thousand by thousand matrix might be already. Uh, if we try to be very fast. Okay, so let's see how we can how we can uh, uh, evaluate that deterministic uh, value uh, assuming both n r and k grows with raised. So the solution is uh, random, comes from the random matrix theory. So I'm just, I'm not going to go into details, just to give a, like very details, just to give that the basic steps, uh, how we can apply some, some of these lemmas and rules and methods to, to compute the uh, deterministic equivalence. Um, of the large system approximation of the, the SINR per user at the output of the N. The first lemma that we use is, is this. I see that we have a, we have a, a matrix A, which is remission, and it's large, then goes to infinity. It's multiplied by an IID vector, which is normalized by N from both sides. You can actually see that it is similar to the uh, so represent matrix RK inverse multiplied by IID vector from all of that. So this type of uh, multiplication, then the N goes to infinity. So this can be replaced with the trace of A, so we don't need to compute the multiplication with the trace of trace. Well, here you don't say same marks yet, but, uh, but this approximation holds, so the difference goes to zero all the time. Can go to the next is to the next. The next one is so called grand computation um, lemma. So, what it means. Just to give you intuition that if you have a product between matrices, well, at least you can even imagine it's A to B identity matrix. Okay, we have just that CN inverse matrix here. So now, if the size of N, the matrix, which is N by N, all of this goes to infinity, at the same time, the rank of the matrix. Goes to infinity. Uh, adding one more, a rank one matrix into C does not really affect the value. That makes make sense because rank goes to infinity, you know, infinity plus one is approximately the same as infinity, right? So this difference goes to zero, then n goes to infinity. Okay. Uh, in um, understand. Okay, then uh, the third theorem that we, we use here is so called Stilkes transformation. So, there we just say uh, what I want to you don't have to really uh, basically in this course to get into. Details where it follows from. What I want you to, uh, to notice here is that we have this type of structure here, right? which is very similar to structure of the one here. Matrix here can be written as H capital H times capital H terminal plus a diagonal term. And then we have the index. So if you have a matrix like a, a Hermitian uh, matrix y y Hermitian uh, minus a, a diagonal term inverse, that can be approximated to the trace of a diagonal matrix. 
where the time of terms are computed from a fixed point intervals. And now you can see that the fixed point iteration only depends on uh, statistical properties of the matrix or the areas of the instance. You can think is yij is equivalent to h hij, like one entry in the channel matrix H, and the big variance A, right? AK. Okay, that's the XYZ. So this is the uh, just a fixed point there. You start from some value and start iterating until converge. And then you get these delta one to delta n values. It's of course you have to this is an approximation always, it's an approximation for a finite. Finite n. This holds only in the infinity. For the finite case, there's always non zero. Okay? But the difference varies. And then we see that the difference is very small, even for fairly small values. Okay? Randomly, this theory that we take the uh, uh, very large system approximation. It holds only in the infinity, but we apply it to the finite regime and get a good approximation. Okay, so how can we use these three of these two lemmas and one theorem to compute the determinant, the deterministic um, equivalent of, of the, the SINR form? Okay. The SINR depends on this power. Allocation uh, matrix E, diagonal E1 to TK. And now, what we do here is that we increase the number of receive antennas to infinity. Also, we increase the number of users to infinity, keeping a certain ratio in the R over K. It could be 2, it could be 10, it could be whatever. Right. But both NR and K should go to infinity. Okay. Well, it should become one. All right. So now let's look at um, RK. So we have this part here. We call this um, sigma K. Okay. We call this all. Or given you the K, this is this consists of all interference used. Okay. And then we call the capital. It includes also the uh, right. Sigma K. Uh, sum over a chi is chi. Chi. This can be, of course, written as the uh, uh, AK bar the AK bar. Includes all all channels a minus one k plus one so all channels except hk okay and then we just call uh what was it sigma sigma is simply Summation over all. Okay. Here you can see over the, uh, the rank one perturbation coming. Okay. <laughs> so basically, when A goes to infinity, the rank goes to infinity. So approximately the rank of these two becomes the same. Okay. Only thickness of one. 
All right. So now this is the uh, uh, the SINI expression. What we have done here is that we have separated the large scale plane component from the IIE smart. Okay. So now we have a, an, uh, an an IIE vector here. So we have a matrix, permission matrix, by a, an IIE vector from both sides. Okay. But then we have to also normalize it by NR. How we can apply the first lemma? Okay. Now, NR to the unknown. Right. I'll, I'll check that way. Okay, so now we have a trace of this matrix. Okay. Now we apply lemma two, just adding rank one matrix. So we replace sigma k with sigma. Okay. Approximately same when n goes to infinity. Okay. And now we declare uh z to be minus n zero. So we have the uh still this transform this form. So sigma here is the uh this prime matrix H H permission P in this way we can put P inside H right? P times the uh um, so P can be included in the, in the large scale coefficient A, right? So that's the statistics. And then we declare Z to be minus N zero. So we can get an approximation for this by computing this, right? Where the Z is minus N zero. And this alpha alpha square values are equivalent to pk times hk. Okay. And you just plug in to this fixed point iteration and get this data value, this diagonal data matrix. And you get an X approximation of this Okay. So the nice thing here is that you don't have to really compute this. So when the M becomes large, the computation of the MMSC matrices, uh, MMSC vectors of the SINR becomes uh, impossible after a point and the size becomes large enough. And you can compute it. Uh, we have this iterative process that depends only on the statistics. And here in this, this figure, we, uh, we compare the uh, accuracy of this large system approximation. So here we consider a scenario where number of users is equivalent to number of receive antennas. Okay. And then we plot the variance. Um, taken over multiple channel realizations uh, of this difference, the actual entire not minus the deterministic equivalent. Okay, and you can see that when we have a low number of users, let's say 48 in this case, 48 users, 48 continents, does not seem to be a very good approximation yet. It's only not 48, four. Four users, eight users. Okay, I was thinking 48 is a large number. Typically, in, in random matrix theory, eight plus quantity becomes infinity. 
but not quite here. But in any other case, if you look at the, <coughs> for example, the, the eigenvalue distribution, when we look at the, the capacity case, that was really, really good match already. You can see that for 16 users, 32 users, it starts to be really good match. And then it goes almost to zero for 256 users and other, right? So there's a very little difference between the actual deterministic equivalent. And recall that these users are, they have random channels. I don't recall that, but they might have actually uh, the same address. I don't know. I should check it. But anyway, it, 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 it shows this equivalent. All right, let's take a little break at this point. Uh, let's get back to uh, 15 packs and continue with the uh, increase of freedom. The uh, the calendar in the first uh, midterm was supposed to happen happen on twenty third, but we'll postpone it to the next week. Tuesday, okay. starting at nine. We are now. If someone has a problem with that, well, certainly it is like that. Well, and I want to align this. In class, so also that the virtual audience should also attend. Only exception allowed is that if you are um, approved and no residence permit, so we can take it remotely. But the rest of the students in class get back to normal. Auntie, excuse me, it was mute for 30 seconds. You can again say for the student that you are looking for new students. Ah, okay. Yes, so it was muted. So uh, again, an ad, and you might have received an email that I'm looking for students. Also, summer trainees, first year students are also welcome to approach me. And then second year students for master thesis positions. And then typically, I can also hire uh, doctoral students after the master master thesis. It's completed. Okay, let's move on to the topic of today. All right. Just a reminder uh, from the Size of 
So in the virus communication, two floors, we consider this multi multi user scenario. Uh, at every network node. And we started in the house in China. So why it was H1? I'm ignoring the time units here. Plus M, right? So the receive signal is just a superposition of transmitted symbols to the time. And then added the third signal is that it. Uh, so when we plot the rate region, we we feel that the uh, pentagon like in the um on the other case. So maybe we notice that the orthogonal of that energy when we split the time between these two users. The size of case and serve one user at the time and finding a uh, optimal share alpha and one minus alpha will actually be a sum rate optimal. So it touches the sum rate region in one point. That's the sum rate. Of, of course, that is orthogonal. Strategy is not able to actually spread the case. Still able to access the sun ray. Sun ray means 2.6 and the CDM strategy will actually the sun ray. But this is not the case <clears throat> in the uh, the multi-element case. If you apply the same CDMA solution, multi organic case, it will be this one. It is greatly inferior to the, the uh, capacity of one. Why? If you are missing, Okay, you still get the beam for game, right? You still get the beam for game on that station, but you can steer the transmission, uh, reception to the direction of the transmitter and single on. But you're missing an opportunity to search them at the same time. Imagine that you have a you happen to have channel realization for user one, which is pointing this direction, in this direction to two of the delegate H1. And then we have H2 happens to be, happens to be orthogonal with the one. So, what it means is that if we apply, if we, if we construct x hat by uh, multiplying uh, this is the same with the max filter. Where x plus a combination two zero on a flow interference plus a combination one always and similarly so it's x one minus two. By multiplying and therefore, you two. And incoming gain 
for user two while storing the one. Okay. You can serve these two users at the same time. No loss whatsoever, no interference. So clearly you can see that if you choose in this particular case, if you choose to serve one user at a time, you lose the decrease of rate. You're losing rate, right? You lose 50%. Well, not 50%, you can focus the power. Actually, that's why that's why you get this bending curve there. Okay, so <clears throat> when you're not transmitting, you're saving power, and this is probably average power cost. When you transmit, you can use higher power, and that's why you get this con concave shape. But clearly, you, you lose this, this uh, spatial degree of freedom by doing the form appearance. Okay, so orthogonal strategy, orthogonal strategy is with this up. All right. And the optimal solution is using MMS system. When you get incoming gain plus degree of freedom gain. Obviously, this this type of situation never happens in practice. Right? The likelihood of these two vectors being exactly orthogonal approaches is zero. Right? I can be nearly orthogonal. And if you have a, another scenario where this is H1, this is H2, when you project this one to the orthogonal complement of H1, you lose a little bit, right? The length of this one is larger than the length of this one, but not much, right? You lose in the game okay, or the final game. Obviously, if you have a, if, if these channels are almost uh, dependent, the gain from the projection, uh, sorry, the loss from this projection becomes. And obviously, when they are holding out. Product becomes zero. Basically, uh, you cannot distinguish. So, in fact, this is the extreme scenario. It can be still handled if we have a H1, H2, but now we have this also extremely unlikely scenario that H1 is exactly the same as H2. What would happen now? Can you still vote? Both of these things. Who votes for no? I'm sure. Who votes for yes? Hmm. Okay, the game asking certainly uh, you cannot distinguish because it, what you do. Is you will receive a uh, let's call it h, right? So you have h x plus h two plus n. Okay, now if you receive this using a transition, right? what you will receive is H1, H1 plus H2 plus N. Quite, looks quite the same as there, right? So you can do something, right? You can still do 
toxicity interference cancer rates. When you look at the, <coughs> this, this one has power P1, this one has power 2, uh, uh, P2, right? So, uh, I still a very region. So, even though you do not have liquid supreme up here, at the informing gate, but you can still do uh, rate allocation. You can assume that the rate for user one, even in this case, is assigned assuming full interference from user two. Let me go in first. Of course, the rate is very low, right? But it's still something. And then you can remove x1 and then decode x2 without any interference, right? And you will get one of these two points, okay? You don't get nuclear freedom gain. You could, you could do uh, TDMA. Actually, TDMA would be, in this case, uh, capacity optimal. Oh, sorry, some rate optimal. Because it's, it's kind of equivalent to this model here. It's just a scaling. You have a, just a scaling here. So it's, it's kind of equivalent to the of Mac. It's a little clear. Okay. Maybe you need to um, digest that a little bit. You know, it's the same as, you know, you assign this to be one and this to be one. Well, then you're back to this scenario. And still you have to rate freedom, but no decrease of freedom. Or just one decrease of freedom. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> of course, with MMSC stick, you can, uh, you can handle scenarios, for example, if you have a, let's say, two antennas, and four uh, the curves. With MMSC, you can, you can insert them all the time, okay? But the first two, if you, if you, if you uh, choose to serve all the four users with two degrees of freedom, at the same time, first two users will be highly interference limit, right? The first user will see interference from three other users. It has only two on the basis and has only two on the well, uh, distinguish them in space. So you have to assign very low rates for that user, right? Also for the second user, after removing the first user, the second user will still see interference from two other users. And only to decrease of freedom. Right. After removing the first two users, then we have two users left. Then you have two degrees of freedom, right? In the space domain. So you can the, the linear filter, assuming that these channels, remaining future channels are say uh recently uh uh, that. Yes. Uh, then, uh, then you can you can suppress most of the interference already in the in the space of by the beam form. And so forth. So the MMS is still. Uh, is the capacity optimal, right? So you should you should do you should implement the capacity optimal uh, receiver in that way, serving all the users at once. But it's it's complex because it requires all these stages. Right? You have to first first decode uh, the first user subtract. Uh, and then the city is there, all the time, and so forth. So, in this particular case, 
you get you get split to four users in two groups, for example, and, and serve them in TDMA. Right? So in, in times of one, you would be serving users one and two with full degrees of freedom, based on degrees of freedom, times of two, three and four, and so forth. <coughs> When you compute the average capacity, you can scale into the MMSC sig for the user or just linear MMSC. When you plot the rates with respect to the, the full MMSC sig, the difference is small. Right? It's actually a good homework. Quite a bit long. <laughs> to look at this, this compare the capacity optimal at this linear putting. Okay. Yeah, now that we haven't we actually, since this is a new course, we haven't yet um, completed the homework, so we are. The second, yeah, the second homework is still under development. Okay, let's move on. Um, so this is also follows the same steps as in the in the Spicer case. So far, so good. Now we notice that this degree of freedom, spatial degree of freedom, was the main, the first major major difference when it comes to size of right. Well, that's the only difference. All the process is exactly the same as in the size. But now the orthogonal allocation is strictly subtle. Okay, similarly as in the size of case, you can consider slow fading, no channel state information to transmitter. <clears throat> so, for simplicity, we have this slow fading scenario that, uh, that the time again uh, it is uh, it's fixed over the transmitter, but unknown at the transmitter. So the transmitter really does not know which rate it can for sure it can communicate with uh, currently success of decoding. Right? So there's always an outage property. So obviously, the smaller you set the rate at the transmitter, the larger the outage. But there's uh, the larger the success probability, the smaller the outage, and vice versa. Right? So it's a bit of it. Um, So, you know, there are risks involved. So, if you look at the, uh, uh, if you consider the two user case, basically, two user case, and one is two. So we have the for a given pair H1 and H2. Okay? So users are transmitting these symbols, encoded symbols to the Gaussian code group as in our Gaussian um, um, capacity optimal uh, transmission strategy for a given. Um, well, Gaussian signal in the transmitter. So, um, as, assuming a certain pair H1 and H2, we can draw the capacity region. Right? So, this is conditioned by a certain pair H1 and H2. Okay? But now the transmitters, they don't know. The shape of this pentagon, right? So they have to kind of uh, turn it blindly, but well, blindly set the. Uh, well, on, on average, I would I would guess that users would would know at least the uh, R I, right? The, the path game. so they would know the average SNR, right? 
right? So that would be at least an indication that, okay, given this SNR was prosecuted, it's great that I can meet. So this would be that. We can ask about, but then the actual channel state, so the failing state, the complex values of the channel vector are not known, right? Only the statistics. It's for that. <laughs> okay, so now, given this channel, uh, if, if user one chooses to uh, with this rate, okay, here it is less than the the single user bound, but at the same time, user two chooses to transmit into this rate, so the rate pair would be here. So it's clearly outside the rate region, right? It cannot be decoded, right? Because we, if, this, if this X2 was not there at all, then receiver one signal could be decoded. But since that the base station receives a superposition of x1 and x2 multiplied with the channel coefficients, it should first be called one, assuming the other as interference. Right? So none of them, none of these x1 or x2 can be decoded, uh, assuming the other one as interference. Right? Because the point is outside the okay. range. Same here, right? This point satisfies two constraints out of three. It satisfies the, the single unit bound, but not the sum rate bound. Right? <laughs> Only the points that are inside. The rate region are decodable. So, this is the definition of how uh, for a given rate allocation. For given our rate allocation R1 to Rk, so given here, if any of these uh, two to power k minus one constraints is violated, right? For the three user case, we have seven constraints. If any of those constraints is violated, we have an output. But this, this is how you should be. Okay. It's the sum rate over all this any, for any subset of S is higher than the actual um, actual rate given these channels, then we have an output. Right. Does this make sense? For two user case, we have three constraints. Single user constraint and the sum of constraints. If n happens to be outside, right? That's what the right hand side is saying. Larger than the main region, then we have a problem. It cannot be decoded. None of the messages can be decoded. Okay? Because in that case, you know, we get the base data gets nothing is true, we have not, not acknowledged it to something else. Okay, switch to VMA, right? Try try something else, one user at a time. In this particular case, user one and two, if X2 is silent, and the user two is 
Of course, it's also a case and another story. Okay, penguin channel, but now uh, trans -page. So basically, when we are we are transmitting, the channel model is written. The channel is not anymore fixed, but we have a uh, the basic signal, the time is in the combination of the transmitted uh, signal from the one, the time is an M, uh, propagating to the channel vector uh, of user one, which now divides for each. So for simplicity, we assume here for the, for the capacity computation that each n is drawn from IAP, right? But it doesn't matter. Can be applied to any failing rising statistics, or it can also apply to correlated time correlated failing scenario as long as the transmit the uh, covert covers all possible channel realizers, right? Then we can put it the capacity applies. So basically, as long as we set the rate. Remember that the single user case, as long as we set the rate, input rate, and the transmitter to be strictly below ergodic capacity, average capacity over all channel realizations, the receiver can be called. Of course, it requires that, that um, we have to know average over both uh, the noise and the fade. <laughs> So you have to, you know, the, in practice, the, uh, the covert has to be extremely long. Right? Okay, infinitely long in the capacity sense. If you want to approach the capacity, the covert is you have to average out the impact of both noise and the failure. Any kind of that. Because if you have a frequency domain also available, then you can also add this over the frequency. Okay. And over here. <clears throat> but now the rate region is the same as for the fixed non scenario, uh, but replacing, just adding the expectation. Okay, it's exactly the same. That's <laughs> here, but we, that is no expectation involved over the dating code. And the resulting break fusion. Okay, but now this uh, constraints, red constraints are average constraints over the data studies of H1 and H2. Okay. So as long as the, the, the rate is, as, is assigned, the average rate, was the transmit from the computers and whatnot. The gray area has to be inside the gray region. After averaging over all the channels, again, uh, making the, the covert so large that, um, that all the fading realizations can be uh, included in that average, then we can guarantee the goal. Of course, in practice, 
it is not practical, right? Because think about think about the uh, implementation of the MMS stage. Right. First, if you if you decide to decode order one and two, right? So you want to decode first uh, user one, assuming user two as interference. First of all, you have to you have to collect you have to accumulate all these samples, time samples in the memory. Memory goes to infinity, right? And uh, it's almost infinity. And then you you uh, process over this very large N to detect, detect the transmitted message or messages uh, over this N transmit uh, the symbols. And based on those, you can reconstruct uh, the S1 for each transmitted time interval, and then subtract from the, the received uh, time samples from the memory to remove, also reconstructing basically the whole thing here and remove it, right? So, you can delay, right? You have to wait <laughs> and then subtract from all those memory elements. And then you can proceed to use a tool without a break. These are just some, it's a capacity bound, right? This is something that we can do better, right? Of course, in practice, we do something, right? The frequency of the end, for example, in easy, easy in the, in the 4G, 5G systems to accumulate um, bits because the bandwidths are, are so large, right? So you don't, unlike in the 2G, 3G systems when the bandwidth is narrow, we have to accumulate bits in the time domain, which causes delay, right? But now in the and it's a large so that you can construct these code words in frequency domain and you get really good coding uh, performance using LEDs with very small latency and very close. Okay. So those scenarios were without time of setting for So now if we have full CSIP, it's, it's now over over time. But we could also also uh, imagine that this expectation is over subcarriers, right? It's a just one time time instance, but then we have very frequency selective channel, like in your own work, like you have just every Subcarrier is IMD. There's no correlation between um, apps and subcarriers, which is not the case in practice, of course. In practice, the frequency response is correlated and you block the, the mm -hmm. FFP or multipath channel with finite number of paths. <clears throat> IMD basically requires that you have as many caps as OFD and the size of the FFP, where each tab is IID. Communication spaces. So this expectation here is over time, but it could be over frequency as well. This is something practical, right? Because expectation over time requires that you go to infinity in time. Right? This is not practical. Okay, so now uh, the difference in the previous case is that we can make the power function of the channel. Previously, there was no CSIP at the transmitter. The power is fixed. We don't know, you know, you can of course fluctuate the power, but it doesn't help because you cannot really uh, 
Um, it doesn't move. The top demo strategy is keep it all over. Now, if you know the channel, if you have a the full CSI view, basically the base channel, of course, the users, this, this user here, for example, it doesn't, there's no way without explicit feedback for this user to know the channel of the second user, right? There's no way. Even if we have TDD. The TDD, of course, this user can measure its own channel from the, the downloading files. But it does not know this channel. But the base station knows everything. So base station again, this is computation. And then and the import is power allocation resistance, break allocation over the downloading feedback channel, right? And that's the way to implement this type of this was all of this in practice. All right. Still, for a given power allocation, if you take any power allocation, this power allocation, we get the uh, right? For another power allocation, we get another pen. Right? Another pen. Or uh, now, if we go through all feasible power allocations, these have to be described here the feasible power allocations. Okay, the power has to be positive, and the, the average power has to be uh, less than. The power constraint per user. But now we can we can allocate this power freely in in time domain, right? We can choose to not to use power at all given or given time interval and then use more power for another or any combination. Or we can think this as that power allocation over frequencies, right? If we allocate more power to few channels, less power to to let's say uh, Fading sub areas and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. So when we now go through all these feasible power allocations, we get a we can take a uh, uh, a union of all these feasible pendulums. Now we, when we look at this, this uh, break region of the union has this uh, five interesting, six interesting uh, regions. One, but five. Okay, we have a flat region here, then we have this concave region here, and then we have the flat region here, concave region here, and again. So, if you recall from the wireless uh, communication tool, the rate region for uplink with signal transmitters will fly We have a uh, Black region here due to the individual power constraints at both users. And then concave part here. Right. Each point corresponding to the certain tender point. Right. Here, here, this indicates already that the decoding order last year. This is the first. And here the decoding order is reversed. But then there was one point that the pentagon actually reduced to a circle. This is the sun point for the size of case. And that corresponds to order. 
this this was the greatest strategy. Uh, user for any human client instance with the largest channel gain. Right. This was the summary of the most of the If you have uh, this users trading channel, the one, and then trading channel for user two. Basically, it's fighting the piece. That was the strategy. It was the summary of my orthogonal strategy. In the first case, okay. But the orthogonal strategy is not, as we noticed already, for the fixed channel. Orthogonal strategy is not optimal for the multi channel case because we would lose the risk of data. Telling one user at the time, pick this up. You should use. Always uh, uh, serves at least the minimum NR case T at any given time. Okay. So that's why we don't have a we don't have a single point. The sum rate this corresponds to the sum rate region region, but it has this flat time series region. So this is the of course, we can be fifteen block with a single on the red region here. Okay, similarly to our same case, we can find the whole red region. Using this way, it's some rate maximizers. There's no need to go through all possible feasible power allocations. But you can you can maximize, you can find a point in the, in the rate region by fixing a ratio to one, mu two. You know, I just stand to well clear. And change my line this this uh, ratio plus eighteen. Now you will just go through a grid of these ratios, and then you can collect all these points with the same And then you can. Okay, I'm not showing here. The, the basic the formula is very much the same as in the size of case. This thing is actually for the why are some of us in two? But we will, we will uh, come back to this when we discuss the minor, minor case, not use the minor case. Okay. All right, so we discussed about the Already, I started with this uh, one user at a time strategy, which is summary and optimal in the size of case. Right? For any time instant, you choose just one user, which is happens to have the, the best channel at the given time instant. Right? <clears throat> of course, we can consider. Similar simple orthogonal strategy also for the multi case. Okay. Just instead of scalars, consider vectors, like absolute values of scalars, consider forms of vectors. And it's the same policy. Choose the user with the highest tool, highest gain. At the any given time. This is one possible strategy, but of course, it's very wasteful because you are not using uh, the <laughs> But very simple to implement. Okay. Might be sufficient. If you want to avoid all this 
complicated. Uh, if you have a lot of bandwidth, for example, and you want to avoid all this complicated MIMO processing at the receiver, just do this TDMA and then inform the game. This could be, for example, like for example, if you have a, if you have only, if you're operating on the, let's say, uh, very high frequency, right, and you need any very large antenna arrays, um, like in the YG standard, which operates on 60 gigahertz, but then it requires a large antenna array to recover the bad loss. But implementing a fully digital uh, um, receiver transmitter structure for such scenarios would be very costly. So what you can do is that you just have one basement chain, but then analog be for like this. But there are a lot of complications that you have. You don't know the channel, you have to uh, search for the user in the tandem and try all these possible directions. But in the end, if you have multiple users, in that case, this would be that you could implement the same quality. If you can serve only because you have only one degree of freedom, because you have only one basement chain, you can serve one user at a time. But if the, if the beam format happens to be matched, if you have some statistics or other means to learn the channel, I don't know, uh, that you could point with analog beams to the strongest user at any given time, you could get the same. Okay, then so it's because it's applies to let's say indoor scenarios where there's very little trading anyways. If you apply this, you would actually choose the strongest the closest user always, right? Because that has the best channel. Okay. Okay, but anyways, in general, consider you can consider the same extension of the size of case to the multiple under case. Restrict it to be strictly orthogonal, serving the strongest user at the time. What happens is that the statistics changes. You recall that in the single one case, the, uh, the statistics of the HK, HK uh, uh, square follows chi square distribution, which Two n r degrees of freedom, right? This corresponds to n r one, so two degrees of freedom. Uh, really trading. Now, if you consider larger number of antennas and normalize, right? So this this is a chi square distribution with ten degrees of freedom, five times two. Two degrees are i and q, right? Because it's complex, right? So it has. Two degrees of freedom, uh, freedom from I and Q times number of objects, 10 degrees of freedom. So you can see that the distribution gets narrower. Now, if you go to extremely large number of them, so we have a single on case, case, uh, five. Um, then on five, so now if you have, let's say, 100, something like this, because of the atom, right? H divided by nr, that goes to one, and nr goes to infinity, right? This is exactly what happens. So, when the size of the, the underlying rate becomes large, the distribution of the channel gain at the output of the match filter becomes less and less. Right. So you can see that in the single antenna case, there's a huge variation in this value. Right. So if one user happens to have this value here, that the other user should have much higher channel gain value, right? So when you add users, you have more and more users, it's likely that one of the users will have a large value, right? 
Yes, the tails are long. The tail is long for this case. But now, when you have more antennas, there's a lot of averaging over antennas. And therefore, the difference between users vanishes, right? So you don't get the selection gain, the multi user diversity gain anymore. Asymptotically, you have just the peak here, non selection gain at all, right? Okay, let's continue with this um, for the next Tuesday. Okay. And uh, that's our <laughs>